This is the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter, 2022. Welcome to Lesson 13, Let Brotherly Love Continue, ready for teaching on March 26. It's part of the series In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews, authored by Dr. Felix Cortez, Associate Professor of New Testament Literature in the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. And I'm your reader for today, Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, March 19. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to the last Sabbath of this quarter. As we look at the book of Hebrews, we find so many interesting things, so many valuable things, and so many spiritual directions that point us right back to Jesus as the source of our faith and the source of our salvation. And as we open your word this week, we just want to know that every step of our way that you are with us and that we will share what we have from you with those about us with brotherly love. And today I'd like to pray for those who are listening in Barbados and St. Lucia, Sydney, Australia, Nashville, Tennessee, Cairo, Egypt, Tokyo in Japan, and Guam in Micronesia. And of course, for everyone who's listening this week, I'd just like to pray that your Holy Spirit will be there to bless. May they know the presence of Jesus in their lives and the value of the relationship with him. Bless us now, we pray, as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And our memory text this week is only four words. It's from Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Let's read that again. Hebrews 13 verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Hebrews chapter 13 presents the apostles' concluding admonition. Let brotherly love continue. He has affirmed throughout the epistle that we are of the household of the King High Priest Jesus, his brothers and sisters. The author does not conceive of the audience only as a group of individuals who work on their salvation in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus, but as a family or household saved together. Paul has characterized the work of Jesus for us as brotherly love. He was not ashamed to call them brothers, we read in Hebrews 2, verse 11. Thus, believers should do for one another what Jesus did for them. Throughout the letter, brotherly love involved exhorting one another, so that no one would fall short of the grace of God, as we read in Hebrews 3.11, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much much the more as you see the day approaching. And Hebrews chapter 12, verses 15 to 17, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward he wanted to inherit the blessing. He was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. In chapter 13, it involves numerous elements. Hospitality, as in Hebrews 13 verse 2, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels visiting and supporting prisoners and those who have been mistreated, we read in verse 3, remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Honouring marriage, in verse 4, marriage is honourable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. 
Avoiding covetousness, verses 5 and 6, let your conduct be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remembering and obeying the leaders of the church in verses 7 to 17, remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Do not be carried away with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat, for the bodies of those animals, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But, Do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. And praying for the author himself in verses 18 and 19. Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honourably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you sooner. Sunday, March 20, Caring for God's People Read Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, Romans 12, 13, 1 Timothy 3, 2, Titus 1, 8, and 1 Peter 4, verse 9. What was the role of hospitality in the early church? First of all, Hebrews 13, 1 and 2, Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Romans 12.13, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. 1 Timothy 3.2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behaviour, hospitable, able to teach. Titus 1 verse 8, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled. And 1 Peter 4 verse 9, Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Christianity was a wandering movement that often depended on the hospitality of both Christians and non-Christians. The instruction to not forget to show hospitality probably does not simply refer to the failure to think about taking someone in, but about willful neglect. Paul does not have in mind hospitality only for fellow believers. He reminds his readers that by entertaining strangers, some have unwittingly entertained angels, as we read in Hebrews 13.2. He probably had in mind the visit of the three men to Abraham and Sarah that we read about in Genesis 18, verses 2 to 15. And that reads, So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and bowed himself to the ground, and said, My Lord, if I have now found favour in your sight, 
Do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that you may pass by, inasmuch as you have come to your servant. They said, Do as you have said. So Moses hurried into the tent of Sarah and said, Quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. Then they said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? So he said, Here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life, and behold, Sarah your wife shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child, since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. Offering hospitality implies sharing possessions with other people and suffering with them, which is what Jesus did for us, as expressed in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 to 18. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren, in the midst of the assembly I will sing praise to you, and again I will put trust in him, and again, here am I and the ch children which God has given me. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For, in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted." Brotherly love toward those in prison implied not only that believers remembered prisoners in their prayers, but also that believers provided relief through material and emotional support. There was a risk of willful neglect of prisoners. Those who provided material and emotional support to those condemned by society identified themselves with them. In some sense, they became partners with them and made themselves vulnerable to social abuse, as we read in Hebrews 10, 32-34. But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Paul's exhortation uses images and language to encourage the readers in regard to prisoners. First, the author evokes the reader's own support for their incarcerated brethren in the past. 
They had become companions or partners to those who had been publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, as we read in verse 33. Second, the language of mistreatment echoes the example of Moses, who chose rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin, as we read in Hebrews 11.25. Finally, Paul captures the ideal of brotherly love. He reminds the readers that they also are in the body, as you read in Hebrews 13.3. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. They share the same human condition and should treat others as they would like to be treated if they were in the same circumstances, that is, in prison. The people should then provide material and emotional support to prisoners, showing them that they are not abandoned. And so to finish today, what more can we do for those who are in prison, whether church members or not? Monday, March 21. Covetousness and Sexual Immorality. Read Hebrews chapter 13, verses 4 and 5, Luke 16, verses 10 to 18, 1 Corinthians 5, 1, Ephesians 5, 3 to 5, and Colossians 3, verse 5. What two evils are related in these passages. First of all, Hebrews 13, beginning at verse 4, marriage is honourable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. And Luke 16, beginning at verse 10. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail." Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. And 1 Corinthians 5 verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And Ephesians 5 verses 3 to 5. But fornication and all all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God." And Colossians 3 verse 5, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Paul warns the readers against sexual immorality and greed because they are two grave threats to brotherly love. In fact, New Testament authors and ancient moralists noted a connection between them. 
Paul's call to honour marriage implies the avoidance of anything that would belittle it. This avoidance included abstaining both from violation of the marriage oath and from unwarranted divorces, as we read in Matthew 19, verse 9. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. The exhortation to keep the marriage bed undefiled refers to avoiding the profanation of marriage through sexual relationships outside of marriage. The expression fornicators refers in the New Testament to every form of sexual immorality. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 11. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And Ephesians 5, verse 5. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And First Timothy 1, verses 9 and 10, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. And Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, and Revelation 22 verse 15. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. In addition, Greco-Roman society was lax in regard to sexual ethics. A double standard was common. This allowed men license in their sexual relationships as long as they were discreet. Paul warns, however, that God will judge adulterers. Believers should not let social conventions establish their own ethical standards. Love of money was one of the main sources of vices in the Greco-Roman world. In fact, in another letter, Paul referred to love of money as the source of all evils. 1 Timothy 6 verse 10, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The defence against this vice is an attitude that Paul encourages in several epistles. First, they should be content with the things they had. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. And Philippians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Furthermore, 
Christians should believe and embrace God's promise that God would never leave nor forsake them, as we read in Hebrews 13, verse 5. This promise was given in several places and moments to his people and is available to us today, as we read in Genesis 28, verse 15. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. And Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 6 to 8. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And verse 8, and the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. And Joshua 1 and verse 5, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. And First Chronicles 28 verse 20, and David said to his son Solomon, be strong and of good courage and do it. Do not fear nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, my God, will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you until you have finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. Believers, then, are invited to respond to God's promise with the words of Psalm 118, verse 6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? This reference to Psalm 118 is appropriate because the psalmist expressed there his confidence in God, despite the suffering inflicted upon him by unbelievers. And so to finish today, what are the ways that contemporary society undermines sexual purity and at the same time feeds the human love of money? In what practical ways can we strengthen our defences against these two dangerous vices? Tuesday, March 22, Remember Your Leaders. Read Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 to 17. What should be our relationship with our leaders? Hebrews 13, beginning at verse 7. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Obey those who rule over you and be a submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Hebrews chapter 13 verses 7 to 17 contains an exhortation to respect and obey the leaders of the congregation. It begins with an invitation to remember those leaders of the past who spoke the word of God to them, and it closes with a call to obey the leaders of the present. Hebrews 13.17 Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. 
The leaders of the past are most likely those who first preached the word and founded the congregation. The call to remember them does not simply refer to a mental exercise of recollection or to an external tribute honouring them. Paul explains that they are to remember them by considering the outcome of their conduct and by imitating their faith. For Paul, the greatest act of remembrance and praise is emulation. In this way, Paul has added the founding leaders of the congregation to the list of faithful heroes whom believers should carefully consider. This list includes the heroes of faith of Hebrews 11 and Jesus, the consummate example of faith in Hebrews chapter 12. The author further notes that Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever in Hebrews 13 verse 8. He stands in stark contrast to false teachers who change with time and whose teachings become various and strange, as we read in verse 9. The call to remember the leaders in Hebrews 13.7 is restated in more forceful terms at the end of the section. Believers are exhorted to obey the leaders because they watch out for their souls. The leaders are described here as pastors who are in charge of the spiritual well-being of the congregation, their flock, and who will give an account to God for their spiritual state. Also, we we'll look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. And 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 10 to 15. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can any one lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any one builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work, of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, for he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Certainly, too, the idea should apply to all our church leaders as well as to all levels of the denomination today. The context also suggests that these leaders are under-shepherds who serve under Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, as we read in Hebrews 13.20, Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. The combination of care and faithfulness from the leaders and obedience or trust from the members will result in joy. This may mean that the leaders will be able to serve the congregation with joy or that they will give an account of the congregation to God with joy and not with grief. And so to finish today, what can you do to strengthen or improve the leader-member relationship in your congregation as well as around the world? Wednesday, March 23. Beware of diverse and strange teachings. Compare Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9, Hebrews 2, 9, Hebrews 4, 16, and Hebrews 6, 19 to 20. 
Where is grace obtained? How are our hearts strengthened? Hebrews 13.9 Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. And Hebrews 2.9 But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. And Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And Hebrews 6.19 and 20, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The relationship between false teachings and foods, touched on in Hebrews 13.9, probably does not refer to the distinction between clean and unclean foods. Why? First, Paul does not seem concerned in the epistle with the distinction between clean and unclean foods. We know from Acts 15 that the early Christian church affirmed both that believers are saved by grace and that they should continue to observe some food regulations. Let's read Hebrews 15 verses 7 to 11 first of all. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the truth, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. And then the same chapter, Acts 15, verses 19 and 20. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. The distinction between clean and unclean foods and other biblical regulations are not opposed to grace. In fact, Paul argues that the new covenant has put the law in the heart in Hebrews 8, 10 to 12. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbour, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. What the author makes very clear, however, is that animal sacrifices and the Levitical priestly mediation in the sanctuary have been superseded by the superior sacrifice and priestly mediation of Jesus, as we read in Hebrews 8, verses 4 and 5, For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed that he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. And Hebrews 10, verses 1 to 18. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshippers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. 
But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sins you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them. Then, he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now, Where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Second, the context suggests that Paul is criticising the audience not for abstaining from certain foods, but for partaking of them with the hope of somehow obtaining grace or merit, as we read in Hebrews 13.9. He is probably warning against participating in Jewish ritual or cultic meals that were celebrated as an extension of the animal sacrifices in the temple and which were supposed to provide spiritual benefits or grace. But grace is not mediated through these meals. Grace comes only through the sacrifice and priestly mediation of Jesus Christ. Believers have an altar, as we read in Hebrews 13.10, the cross of Christ from which they can eat, as we read in John 6.47-59. Hebrews 13.10, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat, and John 6, beginning at verse 47. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarrelled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live for ever. In Hebrews, grace comes from the throne of God. As you read in Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This grace, mediated through Christ, is an anchor, sure and steadfast, that is fastened to God's throne itself. As you read in Hebrews 6.19 and 20. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek.
Hebrews 4.16 Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It is this grace which we receive through the sacrifice of Christ that provides stability and assurance to our hearts. When the heart has been established in this way, it will not be carried away by new doctrines. As we read in Hebrews 13.9, Do not be carried away with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. Nor... Will it drift away from God, as we read in Hebrews 2, one? Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. And so to finish today, dwell on Christ's complete sacrifice. Why then is the idea of anything that we do adding to this sacrifice contrary to the gospel and the grace that is found in Jesus? Thursday, March 24, go to Jesus outside the camp. Compare Hebrews 13, 10-14, Mark 8, 34, Matthew 10, 38, Luke 14, 25, and my favourite text in the whole Bible, Galatians 2, 20. What does it mean to go to Jesus outside the camp? Hebrews 13, beginning at verse 10, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. And Mark 8.34 when he had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And Matthew 10.38 And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And Luke 14.28 And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The place outside the gate was the most impure of the whole camp. The carcasses of the sacrificial animals were burned there. We read about this in Leviticus chapter 4 and verse 12. The whole bull he shall carry outside the camp to a clean place, where the ashes are poured out, and burn it on wood with fire, where the ashes are poured out, it shall be burned. Lepers also were excluded from the camp. Leviticus 13.46. He shall be unclean. All the days he has the saw, he shall be unclean. He is unclean, and he shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. And blasphemers and other criminals were executed there. Leviticus 24.10-16. Now the son of an Israelite woman, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the children of Israel. And this Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought each other in the camp. And the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. And so they brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Shelemith, and the daughter of Dibri, of the tribe of Dan. Then they put him in custody, that the mind of the Lord might be shown to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take outside the camp him who has cursed, then let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation 
stone him. Then they shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin, and whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him, the stranger as well as him who is born in the land. When he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. And verse 23, Then Moses spoke to the children of Israel, and they took outside the camp him who had cursed and stoned him with stones, so that the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. And First Kings chapter 21, verse 13, And two men, scoundrels, came in and sat before him, and the scoundrels witnessed against him, against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth has blasphemed God and the king. Then they took him outside the city and stoned him with stones, so that he died, and Acts 7, 58. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. These regulations presupposed that the presence of God was within the camp. Anything that was impure was cast outside, because God was unwilling to see any unclean or indecent thing in it, as we read in Numbers chapter 5 and verse 3. You shall put out both male and female, you shall put them outside the camp, that they may not defile their camps in the midst of which I dwell. And Deuteronomy 23 verse 14, For the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and give your enemies over to you. Therefore your camp shall be holy, that he may see no unclean thing among you and turn away from you. Jesus suffered on the cross outside Jerusalem, as we read in John nineteen seventeen to 20 And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the Place of the Skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the centre. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. This emphasizes the shame that was cast upon him, as we read in Hebrews 12.2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He was officially condemned as one who had blasphemed the name, and therefore was repudiated by Israel and executed outside the wall. As you read in Mark fourteen sixty three to 64 Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. And we'll compare that with Leviticus 24, verses 11 and 16. And the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed, and so they brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Shelomith, the daughter of Dibri, of the tribe of Dan. And verse 16, And whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him, the stranger as well as him who is born in the land. When he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. Jesus was cast outside the camp as a shameful, unclean, or indecent thing, as you read in Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Paul, however, exhorts believers to follow Jesus outside the gate, enduring the shame that he endured in that same verse. And Hebrews 13, verse 13, Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. 
This also was the path Moses followed. He chose to bear the reproach of Christ instead of the treasures of Egypt, as you read in Hebrews 11.26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Paradoxically, however, Moses suggests that God's presence is now outside the camp. The action of following Jesus outside the camp means not only bearing his reproach or shame, but also going forth to him, as we've just read in Hebrews 13.13, 13, just as those Israelites who sought the Lord went outside the camp in the desert when Moses removed God's tent from the camp after the golden calf controversy, as we read in Hebrews 33.7. Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp, far from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of meeting. And it came to pass that Everyone who sought the Lord went out to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. This account suggests that the rejection of Jesus by unbelievers also implied the rejection of God, as Israel did in the golden calf apostasy in Exodus chapter 32 and Exodus chapter 33. Thus, the path of suffering and shame also is the path to God. Paul invites readers to follow Jesus as the author and finisher of their faith in Hebrews 12.2, implicitly inviting them also to consider their present sufferings a momentary discipline that will yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness, as we read in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. They are leaving behind a corrupted city or camp in search of the city that is to come, whose architect is God, as you read in Hebrews 13.14, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. And Hebrews 11 verse 10, For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And the same chapter, Hebrews 11 verse 16, But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And so to finish the day. What does it mean for you to follow Jesus outside the camp? What are those aspects of the life of faith in Jesus that may bring reproach or shame from those around you? Friday, March 25. After the descent of the Holy Spirit, believers rejoiced in the sweetness of communion with saints, writes Ellen White in the Acts of the Apostles, page 547 and 548. We continue. They were tender, thoughtful, self-denying, willing to make any sacrifice for the truth's sake. In their daily association with one another, they revealed the love that Christ had enjoined upon them. By unselfish words and deeds, they strove to kindle this love in other hearts. But gradually, a change came. The believers began to look for defects in others. Dwelling upon mistakes, giving place to unkind criticism, they lost sight of the Saviour and His love. They became more strict in regard to outward ceremonies, more particular about the theory than the practice of the faith. In their zeal to condemn others, they overlooked their own errors. They lost the brotherly love that Christ had enjoined, and saddest of all, they were unconscious of their loss. They did not realize that happiness and joy were going out of their lives, and that, having shut the love of God out of their hearts, they would soon walk in darkness. 
John, realising that brotherly love was waning in the church, urged upon believers the constant need of this love. His letters to the church are full of this thought. Beloved, let us love one another, he writes, for love is of God. And every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another." And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Christian life often is considered the personal, individual relationship between Jesus and the believer. This is, however, only one aspect of the Christian life. Why is it important to remember that God is leading us as a group? What are my responsibilities to the group? What can I expect from the group? 2. What are the best indicators that brotherly love is strong in a congregation? Be prepared to create a list in your Sabbath school class. 3. What is true brotherly love? What are its characteristics, causes and results? How would you differentiate it from false brotherly love? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Narrow Escape and it's by Seng Suren Fong Chen. God loves me a lot. When a friend moved away to Australia, I agreed to visit her parents every once in a while back here in Thailand. It wasn't easy to visit the parents' house. I had to look up directions and I learned that the house was quite some distance from my own. For my first visit, I filled my backpack and several bags with groceries. Carrying the food, I hailed a three-wheel tuk-tuk taxi to take me to the bus station. Partway through our trip, the tuk-tuk driver suddenly said, I can't take you. Can I call you another tuk-tuk? He didn't give any reason for his change of heart. What could I do? A second tuk-tuk picked me up, but the driver took me to the wrong place. I got into a third tuk-tuk. It took nearly two hours to reach the bus station. I was fuming in frustration when I arrived. Why had it taken two hours and three tuk-tuks for the usual short and simple trip to the bus station? Where are you going? the ticket seller asked me. I was so upset that I couldn't talk to anyone, not even to the ticket seller. I'll talk to you later, I said, turning away. After calming down, I bought a ticket and boarded a minivan. During the trip to the house of my friend's parents, we passed a wrecked minivan on the side of the road. Our driver stopped to see if he could help. Returning to the minivan, he somberly told us that several passengers had died in the crash. This is the minivan that left right before us on this route, he said. At that moment, I realised that I should have been on that minivan. I only missed the minivan because of the many delays in reaching the bus station. My friend's parents were relieved to see me. They had heard about the crash. We were so worried because we thought you were on that minivan, the mother said. God is so good, I said. Then I told my story about the delays to the parents who were not Christians. The God or angel who protects you is really great, the father exclaimed. Yes, God loves me a lot. And there's a photograph of her right here. Seng Suren Fong Chang was principal at the Seventh-day Adventist school in Nakhon Ratchasima, Thailand, that received part of the 13th Sabbath offering three years ago. Thank you for your offering that helped the school. Adventist International Mission School, Korat, expand into a high school at a new site. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. 
Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind, and It Is Written. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, God is always faithful.